thing. What are you most proud of that, that, that the medical institution in this country, let's just keep it simple. What do you, what do you think medicine has done the best job of in the last decade? Well, I think you look at cardiac surgical care. I think you look at, um, line infections in hospitals. I mean, there have been some really big wins here that don't get maybe as much attention as they deserve. What, what else, where else are we hitting it out of the park? Obstetrical care. I think we've not only now have is the infant mortality rate as good as modern medicine can deliver it, but we've now accepted these these new best practices of skin to skin time delayed cord clamping, encouraging breastfeeding early on, reducing C sections when not necessary. These are those are in the last ten years those best practices, but um, we're at a pretty good point where the system is humming on a lot of ac acute care. And there's a video I saw on social media the other day where a guy said, if I get shot, I want to go to a U.S. hospital. We have the best care in the world. If I break a bone, that's where I'm, I'm going to go straight to a doctor. But when it comes to telling me you know, what I should be eating or how to live my life, I don't think I trust modern medicine. If you come in with chronic abdominal pain, sometimes our sophisticated system didn't know what to do, right? So I think mm. the acute care has been mastered. And I think, you know, I think about the operations I was a part of, these laparoscopic whipples, and it's a tour de force of science and technology and uh, advancements. And we do something called a tra pancreas transplant uh, with islet cells now for people with chronic pain. So I think good stuff is happening. We have good people. People go into medicine, nursing, every aspect of healthcare united by one common thing, and that is everybody wants to help other people who are in need. And that's an incredible bond that we have. It's a profession we should all be proud of. It's a heritage you know, I'm um, proud of that my dad uh, was a part of, and I get to do the things he encouraged me to do, little tips ways to connect with patients. I still think of the time he said, don't ask somebody, are you taking your medication? Instead say, you know, some people find it hard to take their medications as prescribed. How are you doing with it? It's far less, you know, head to head. And so it's an incredible profession and teaching these little pearls and gems, citing research, uh, calling out the importance of good scientific methodology, it's still, I think, the best job in the world. And medical centers are still some of the most respected institutions in America, which is why, which is why we've called on them to have ethical billing and and pricing practices. But uh, we can correct course, and I think all in all, it's an incredible privilege to be a part of the medical profession. I encourage anyone to 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 get into it. You would still encourage someone who's sitting here listening to us, who's in college, who's on the fence about going into tech, going into business, going into law, going into medicine. You'd, you'd still give them the nudge to do medicine if it's if it's something they're partially considering? Yes. Where else can you put a knife to someone's skin within seconds of meeting them just because you're the doctor? People will tell you secrets they've never told their spouse within minutes of meeting you because you're the doctor. And so there's an incredible heritage in the profession. And, and so I think it's the best job in the world. Now, you got to be okay with memorizing enzyme names over and over again. I mean, hundreds of names of useless molecules that you could look up on Google. That's just part of the old system and people but you know, I, I think the bigger issue isn't so much that you have to memorize those names. It's that you're you're sort of lacking the context and why. I mean Marty, I still memorize names of complex enzymes and pathways, um, but the difference is I'm doing it because it's feeding my interest. Yes. Right? It's like I'm reading papers and I'm learning new things and I have to draw diagrams to help myself. I mean, I'm doing the same thing I was doing 25 years ago. Um, so I don't, I, I also don't want to let people suggest that it's not important to have knowledge. Like it is important that I know these things, even if they seem a little bit esoteric. But it's just easier to know it when you understand why, when you have a scaffolding around why. Um, I 
while I can't tell you every step of the Krebs cycle, I still remember in great detail how metabolism works because it really matters to what I do. So I, I think if anything, I just hope that medical education can major in the major and minor in the minor, because while I, I think it matters that you understand these things, I, I think it, and again, maybe this is already the case because I'm so far from it, but, but if you understand why the Krebs cycle matters and why when the Krebs cycle isn't working, every disease in the body gets worse. Like, why is it that a person with cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, Alzheimer's disease, that why do they have defective Krebs cycle? That's what I want medical students to be understanding and learning. Yes. So anyway. Yes. Um, I don't know where I stand on it, truthfully. If I, I do get asked from time to time by young people, hey, you know, would you do it all over again? And of course, for me, the answer is undoubtedly yes. But but I also realize there are a lot of other exciting fields in the world today that that maybe weren't available to me. And I don't know. How about surgical residency? <laughs> would you do that part again? You know, I, 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 yeah, it's interesting. Knowing what I know today and knowing where I ended up today, would I have been better off doing a you know, an internal medicine residency? You know, the answer is probably yes. I think it, it would be more logical. But look, I wouldn't know you. I wouldn't know Ted Schaefer. I wouldn't know a lot of the amazing people that I've gotten to know through my surgical training. Um, and I, I think in many ways, surgical training, um, especially the way we did it so long ago, you know, when you didn't have regulations on work hours and stuff, it was so hard that it, um, it really gave me an appreciation for how much easier my life is today um, and how, how lucky I have it to you know, not be woken up every 14 <laughs> minutes when I sleep and, you know, things like that. So, so, so I don't know. I, I don't yeah. know. I'd, I'd probably be reluctant to change anything. I think it all worked out okay. Uh, and I'm really grateful for the folks I met along the way. Um, and, um, and I, and I do hope that, that someone listening to this, who's, who's contemplating medical school, as you said, I, I, I agree with you completely. Anybody who chooses to be anywhere within the vicinity of this field, you, you want to be a nurse, you want to be a radiology tech, you want to be a phlebotomist, you want to be a doctor. The one thing that unites all of those people is um, they're, they're doing it for the right reasons. You know, the sort of kid in high school when asked, what do you want to go into? And they say, I don't know, I'm thinking about being a nurse. They're different from their peers. It's a, it's a calling really mm -hmm. to be in medicine. And so we attract these great folks. I think our challenge in the academic towers is how can we keep the focus both on the test technically sophisticated pieces of metabolism so they understand it, and at the same time not lose sight of the overall person. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I mean, it's the, you, you have to preserve the humanity of the field uh, while harnessing kind of critical thought. Um, and, and, and doing it around, as I said, kind of this scaffolding of purpose. One quick thing. I, I discovered <clears throat> classic example of this. The Pima Indians in New Mexico along the Gila River, they had been cut off with their water supply, farmers and ranchers and settlers. And so this nation of Indians all of a sudden wasn't, they weren't able to grow crops and the healthy foods they'd been eating for centuries. So the U.S. government recognizing how they were being depleted of food and the starvation that was happening, they started shipping food. But of course, it wasn't. This wasn't whole food stuff. This was <laughs> spam and potato chips or whatever else. And they started developing massively high rates of obesity. Diabetes quickly ensued, and so you had this population that was massively obese and di and with diabetes. And the NIH decides to swoop in and address this problem by looking for a predisposing gene for d d obesity and diabetes. And they tested the blood of all these poor Indians. And it's like, we can't see the forest from the trees yeah. sometimes, right? They're, we've been feeding them shit for decades. That is what's been driving the obesity and diabetes. <laughs> it's not that they have a gene. They've had spontaneous mutations of the FTO gene that have now produced <laughs> rampant obesity. <laughs> right. Yeah.